Guardians contacted three generations of one family. But we can talk about it openly so everybody's okay with it. They say they've all shared similar experiences with extraterrestrials. I had him on my upper arm and I was being pulled. The generational abduction. Then a blind man navigates his way through life by clicking his tongue. Paul, I have never had a student who does what he does. How a blind man can see on the next sightings. Aliens contacted three generations of one family. We can talk about it openly so everybody's okay with it. They say they've all shared similar experiences with extraterrestrials. I had them on my upper arm and I was being pulled. The generational abduction on the next sightings. Have aliens contacted three generations of one family? I had them on my upper arm and I was being pulled. They've all encountered extraterrestrials, the generational abduction on sightings. I had them on my upper arm and I was being pulled. Have aliens contacted three generations of one family on sightings? We can talk about it openly so everybody's okay with it. I had him on my upper arm and I was being pulled. Paul, I have never had a student who does what he does. We can talk about it openly so everybody's okay with it. I had him on my upper arm and I was being pulled. I had him on my upper arm and I was being pulled. I had him on my upper arm and I was being pulled. This edition of Sightings, could three generations of this family all be experiencing ongoing alien contact? What was the flavor of their communication? A all sense flavor? of urgency. Sightings has their chilling story. From what these priests can see, their cathedral of San Francisco is one of the prettiest in Lima, Peru. It's what they can't see that's got them scared. Then, newly discovered documents prove that the United States government has been building flying saucers probably seen by many people, and probably some French. And you don't have to believe to understand why she's called Amazing Grace. To the surprise of the medical community, she survived a situation where nobody should have survived. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. The alien abduction phenomenon has come under fierce attack recently. It's laughable, the skeptics insist, 
to believe that extraterrestrial visitors are taking humans against their will for a sinister purpose. But new abductees are coming forward all the time. They withstand the ridicule because for them, alien abduction is not a phenomenon. It's an objective reality. Three generations of one family enjoying a stroll after dinner on a warm summer evening. Playing ping pong. Sitting around the backyard laughing at dumb jokes. It's the good life in Roseville, California. When you're on the outside looking in. But what you can't see on the surface is the bizarre secret that this family shares. A secret that will forever set them apart from their friends and neighbors. When you have a family like ours, very open about it, um, it makes it easier to deal with the fears and the anxieties of finding out something like this. Step up, stand. Shannon Hernandez, her mother, Debbie McGill, and Shannon's five-year-old son, Zachary, believe that they are being targeted by an extraterrestrial force. They are three generations of one family who claim to have been repeatedly abducted by alien life forms. It's a rare phenomenon researchers have named generational encounters. The advantage of the whole family being contactees is that we can talk about it openly so everybody's okay with it. Generational encounters refers to a series of contacts between extraterrestrials and more than one member of a family, and more specifically, between different generations. Sometimes we see three or even four sequential generations who've experienced extraterrestrial contact. Dr. Richard Boylin has done extensive study of the generational encounters phenomenon. He has reached the conclusion that far more cases exist that are actually reported. I would say that certainly in half the cases uh, where there's been contact by ETs over any period of time, there will be contact with um, if the person has children. They may talk to their parent, find out the parent's been secretly harboring a contact experience in his or her own life. And of course, spousal contacts are, are very common. Debbie McGill believes her first alien contact occurred in 1972 in Northern California. Her daughter Shannon has only recently uncovered memories of her own extraterrestrial encounters. In late March, I had a dream um, that I was being pulled by five, what everybody would call grays, your typical gray ETs. I had them on my upper arm, lower arm, and I was being pulled. I woke up terrified, absolutely terrified. Light came in, bed shaking. It's kind of like it all happened at once. I opened my eyes and up on my wall, I saw the face of an ET very clearly. For a couple of weeks, I was real scared of the dark. It was a real adjustment. Shannon kept the frightening images to herself until her son, Zachary, came to her with stories that sounded hauntingly familiar. One day, he came out to me and told me about how the aliens landed in the backyard. He even showed me where they parked. There was a little fear at first for him, too. He was scared of the dark and things like that. And we had an open discussion about it. He told his mother about the ETs coming, and um, they take him to play while Mommy and Daddy sleep. I'm telling the truth here. That's all. That's all I can say. Based on my observations of him, he certainly seems to be a bright uh, kid who's uh, certainly above average for his age group in his uh, poise and, and verbal skills. And there seems to be a statistical trend with kids who've had ET contact that they seem to be at a performance level a bit above average, and you wouldn't expect that to hold true as much as it does if it was just a fluke. To be pulled from bed by an unseen hand and carried away by a non-human form would seem a nightmare for most, but Shannon, Debbie, and Zachary report that the contact has been friendly. Because it has been a positive experience overall, Debbie and Shannon call themselves experiencers rather than abductees. Abductee is, it has a negative connotation to it. it. It means stolen. I prefer to call myself an experiencer because they're not taking me unwillingly. Um, I go quite willingly. If you would track uh, this pencil. Her daughter's and grandson's experiences confirm what Debbie has felt for years. 
that her family has been the object of extraterrestrial scrutiny for a quarter of a century. The reason why is being explored through therapy. Do you notice anything about you? Pictures. Do you know why you're seeing these pictures? Mm, to learn. And this is about the future? Yeah. How far ahead? Way distant in the future? Not way distant. Pretty close in the future? Next few years. Based on the pictures, what would you say is coming up in the next few years? Major changes. Ge geological changes. So is there some kind of overall message you can take from this or lesson? Yeah, not to worry. Things will be okay. And why will things be okay if there's such major shifts? Because it's all for the best. Apocalyptic images conveyed through telepathy or mind control are a common theme among experiencers. And there are very specific images both mother and daughter remember being shown. Did the ETs communicate with you while you were seeing these pictures? Yes. And what was the flavor of their communication? Any general flavor? A sense flavor? of urgency. Urgency. But urgency yet, for what? For me to understand something. ETs give a variety of different kinds of messages, such things as earth changes, um, cataclysms, uh, geological weather, um, epidemics, um, social unrest, wars, uh, have all been shown to experiencers. And it appears that these future scenes are either probable futures that will happen unless we clean up our act. Like a growing number of experiencers, Shannon and Debbie believe that they have been charged with a mission. They have been told to spread the aliens' otherworldly warning, and they have been told to move away from California. They don't know why they are to move, but the family believes that the reason will be revealed to them when the time is right. I just got up one day last summer and said, I've got to move to New Mexico. I mean, I just knew. The entire family has now relocated to New Mexico. Debbie and Shannon are trying to spread the message they believe they've received through extraterrestrial contact. After the completion of this report, Dr. Richard Boylan's license was revoked by the California State Board of Psychology for misconduct unrelated to his work with the McGill and Hernandez families. Both families wrote to the board and to sightings, stating that they continue to believe in and trust the therapy that they received from Dr. Boylan. Next, Dan Kish is blind, but his uncanny ability to see could change the world for the sightless. I have never had a student who does what he does. It's a well-known fact that people who have lost one or more senses, like sight or hearing, can sometimes develop their other senses to an uncanny degree. Doctors call it compensation. Dan Kish, a sightless man in San Bernardino, California, appears to have gone compensation one better. Sightings correspondent Carla Wohl reports on what appears to be Dan's development of an entirely new sense. Imagine trying to navigate the busy world around us without the critical sense of sight, without the ability to see impending danger, or even the ordinary signposts we take for granted. Today, blind people are taught that they need the eyes of another, a dog or a helper, to negotiate the world of the sighted. Dan Kish disagrees. He's developed a sixth sense that gives him complete independence. He's the only human known to use echolocation as skillfully as bats and dolphins. Dan, what is it exactly that you do when you echolocate? Well, usually I click and then I listen for the sound as it bounces off of all the objects in the environment. So something like a bat would do, say, or a dolphin would do? Well, it's exactly the same. Uh -huh. the, the click is different, but the process is the same. Can you tell me where the trees are? Sure. Well, we just passed one, and here we have another, another one. tree? That's smaller than some of these others. Uh-huh. We have one here that's much larger. Dan can visualize an object by the echo it creates. It's a unique ability Dan taught himself as a young boy, before he even knew there was a name for it, or that other animals used the same method. I can remember as him clicking, um, similar to that of a, a bat, I suppose, and uh, trying to locate things in front of him. And 
I used to ask him questions, you know, why are you doing that? And he would tell me that it's, uh, it's his way of uh, moving around. It's his way of uh, seeing things. For me, the signal is a tongue click. It sounds like this. Pull. The object I'm looking for is this bulletin board. I've worked for 21 years as a mobility instructor, and so I've had hundreds of students. I have never had a student who does what he does. In fact, no one is known to do what Dan Kish does. He would walk along, and he would be clicking, and he would know there's a wall on my right, or there's a big tree now on my left side, or I'm coming to the corner, or whatever it happens to be. How specific can you get, for instance, crossing the street here? With your echolocation, can you tell me where a curb is, say, and where a driveway is? Well, sure, they're, they're different heights. Um, the curb is higher, it reflects more sound, the driveway a lot less, and the driveway's just lower. So that's easy for you? Sure. His ability to locate and navigate around obstacles allows Dan to do something no other sightless person is encouraged to do. Uh, the first time Dan uh, rode a bike, and our family saw him riding a bike, is probably uh, the first time that they really realized that Dan could do just about anything he wanted. I used to go bike riding all the time because it was something that I could do. I wasn't relegated automatically to a tandem bike or to riding on someone's handlebars or to just staying at home while everyone else went on a ride. Dan allowed us to challenge his ability to navigate in unfamiliar territory. We took him to a playground studded with metal poles. Incredibly, he avoided them all. The process of riding a bicycle, particularly in unfamiliar areas, is both very exhilarating and very demanding. Demanding to the point where I might say that I can feel myself almost entering another state of consciousness where the senses are wide open and there is no room for any other thought but the process of riding a bicycle itself. Understanding echolocation is, is just in its beginning stages. We seem to have just gotten an appreciation for how miraculous this ability actually is. Dr. Lawrence Rosenblum believes Dan's ability offers a unique opportunity to study how the brain perceives sound. Might be something like getting a quick flash of what an environment is like as if somebody just turned the light on. Um, because what echolocation does is actually illuminate acoustically an environment. We've got a parked vehicle to our left, probably a car. Right. Uh, then a space and another parked vehicle coming up that's much larger than the first a truck or van of some sort. Now, Dan, how can you tell that? I mean, it's, it's enough to, it's to just, know something's there. How do you know it's bigger? It's just larger. It, it reflects more sound and reflects it from a higher direction, you're accounting for the, the height of the vehicle. You're, you're absolutely right. Despite skepticism from traditional instructors, Dan believes he can teach echolocation to other blind people, especially children. It's like if you guys can see with your eyes, and we um, can see with our ears. Teaching a blind child to ride a bike, to run, to roller skate, to tree climb, to rock climb, to hike, to do all those things is vital. All kids can ride a bike. So why should this one kid not be able to ride a bike? By teaching echolocation to others, Dan hopes to forever change the way the blind see and the way we see the blind. Researchers maintain that, at most, humans use 10% of their brain potential. Dan Kish appears to have somehow tapped into part of the remaining 90%. If he has, just imagine what other remarkable abilities must lie dormant within us all. Next, corporate America is turning to psychics to improve its bottom line. Later, the frightening secret that lies beneath Lima's Church of San Francisco. Here are some of the stories Sightings is following in the news. There are an estimated 450,000 Bigfoot watchers in the United States alone. 
In an effort to create a central clearinghouse for reports of the legendary beast, a new Bigfoot Research Center is opening in a very unlikely location. It's flat, it's farmland, and it's in Minnesota. The town of Crookston is about to become home to the world's largest Bigfoot center. The Bigfoot idea got started because when I first came here, they've been dealing with this issue of how to do tourism because we don't have any natural amenities here in Crookston, such as lakes, to use as an asset or a resource. But why Bigfoot? There haven't been any sightings here, but as Holbrook discovered surfing the internet, there have been Bigfoot sightings just about everywhere else. And I thought, well, then this is not just a Northwest, uh, you know, Washington and Oregon and California, where everybody thinks it is. This is really something that's a national phenomenon. And that's when I started thinking, well, how can Crookston take part in this national phenomenon? Soon, this Crookston Museum will be transformed. Preliminary drawings are already underway for new displays, an info center, and a life-size replica of the legendary beast. It'll attract people from outside of our town, as well as giving us another thing to do inside of our town. The local diner may be serving up Bigfoot burgers and dozens of gingerbread feet, but Holbrook insists his center is going to be more than just a tourist attraction. Personally, I would say uh, there's a high potential that this creature exists. Given the right resources, I believe we can prove it. We can put a man on the moon, we can prove whether or not Bigfoot exists. In Palo Alto, California, Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich is renewing his warning about the future of humankind. There is a new generation of drug-resistant bacteria capable of triggering a deadly epidemic. We're likely to lose a large portion of humanity to emerging viruses, to the many now resistant strains of bacteria, to the resurgence of malaria and so on. And there's a lot to be said for that. In other words, the epidemiological situation is extremely uh, severe, largely because of the size of our population, because of our population growth. So we could have a dieback from plague. Recently, sightings reported on an upsurge in the number of deadly viruses unleashed during the destruction of tropical rainforests. Some researchers believe it is Earth's way of turning on its attacker, the human race. It's called Gaia's Revenge, the Earth's Revenge. Now, there is growing concern that these viruses are not alone. New insidious bacteria may prove even deadlier. Mutant forms of pneumonia, immune to penicillin, and new strains of antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis are already appearing worldwide. Some scientists believe that these may be precursors to a global, unstoppable plague. Medical researchers have had to search for ingenious methods to keep these bacteria in check. However, they cannot be certain that humankind will continue to prevail. In New York City, where Wall Street's bulls and bears direct billions of dollars every day, the art of the deal is taking on a whole new meaning. One of the favorite things investors say is that the billionaires use metaphysics, the millionaires don't. Because the billionaires know that magic has a lot to do with making huge amounts of money. Barry Dolnick calls herself an executive mystic. She claims to have counseled some of America's top movers and shakers. I see people on Wall Street, people who run big portfolios, heads of divisions of some of the biggest companies in the world, creative people, artists, actors. In fact, Dolnick herself was once a corporate executive. Metaphysics was just a hobby until she started sharing her psychic talent with a few high-powered clients. I think the interesting thing about Barry that makes her very unusual is her business background combined with, with her ability to uh, work with you on metaphysical things makes her an unusual counselor. Typically, Dolnick uses tarot cards and detailed astrological charts to help clients plot long-term business strategies or evaluate marketing plans. And for help up the corporate ladder, Dolnick mixes individualized herbal charms. However, she always reminds her clients that on Wall Street, there are no guaranteed bets. What I do have a gift in is prophecy, and I can see what's likely to happen in the future, but it's, it's up to you to make it happen. So it's sort of a, it's gotta be a two-way street. We'll have more stories from the news next time. Now, here's what's coming up on Sightings. She's called Amazing Grace, and her healing miracles baffle the medical community.
We are unable to explain why she survived a almost lethal situation. And proof that the United States has been building flying saucers. Faith healing has a long and checkered past in American history. Elmer Gantry comes to mind. Charlatans and thieves have supplanted what were once real healing miracles performed in simple country churches. Today, Grace D. Bakari is on a one-woman campaign to restore the integrity of faith healing. She believes that the way to do that is to heal as many people as she can. evidence is there's a woman with an incurable disease that I know is not fake. She's got six doctors that are telling her, this is the way it is, this is what's going to happen. The best you can do is slow the progress of the disease. Goes to all the, all the fancy clinics, etc. Nothing works. She goes to this lady who's jumping around on a stage singing and banging a tambourine like she was just stepped out of an Elma Gantry movie, and it's gone. To those who believe, she is a savior, an evangelical preacher known simply as Amazing Grace. Grace knelt down to me, and she asked me what affliction I had, and I told her of multiple sclerosis. And all she did at that point was just um, lay her hands on my forehead, and I went right over backwards. They are flocking to her services in Danbury, Connecticut, from all over the country, from all over the world, in fact. They pray for a miracle, and many prayers are being answered. It was an instant healing, a total and instant healing right then and there. Many of the people who come to see Grace DiBacari have been branded with the label incurable, but Grace seems to have an uncanny ability to strip off that label and heal. Grace asked me to, to hand over the cane that I had to her. Um, at which point I did, and she told me to walk from one end of the gymnasium to the other and back to her. Her walking alone on a basketball court was a prescription for a broken arm or a bloody nose or something. Uh, but she went all the way up the aisle, she turned around, she came back the aisle, and then she wandered out of the gymnasium basically in a daze. Uh, and at that point, I forgot pretty much everything except trying to get to her and find out what the heck was going on here. Many people believe Grace can somehow stimulate the power of an individual's mind to heal their own body. Grace's own explanation is much simpler. I don't consider myself a healer. I believe it's his divine healing, and I just call out whatever it he'd have me do. I'm just a regular person, just minding my own business, taking the children to softball. Grace can recall the exact moment she believed she was given her healing gift. I had a near-death experience where I went up into the heavens and I saw a tremendous light and I wanted to enter. It was wonderful. And then I stood there and said, no, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And my spirit went back into my body and I woke up. So I thought, well, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. And then he what I felt God speaking to me, saying, sing and leave the rest to me. I once, I was once a lost, but now, now I am now. God speaks to me, he'll tell me, go to the left, go to the right, go straight down the middle, um, and I'll do it. And as I go, I'll stop, and he'll say, right here. Who here has a problem with their back? Problem with your back, would you come here, please? The crowded hotel ballroom, the laying on of a manicured hand. From the outside, it seems too cliche to be believed. But what sets Grace DiBacari apart is documentation by medical doctors who will confirm the miraculous recoveries of patients once so close to death. She was more abundant, more barely conscious, suffering with seizures, uh, blood pressure problems, uh, kidney failure, uh, severe anemia. She had fluid around the, the heart, fluid around the lung. She was in, in a desperate situation. 
In 1987, Harriet Grimaldi was diagnosed with a supposedly incurable disease called scleroderma. She was told the end was very near. I go upstairs and cry out to God to let me die, because the pain was so bad. For five months, Harriet was kept in the intensive care unit of Phelps Memorial Hospital. Doctors didn't expect that she would ever return home, but Harriet was a fighter. And when she heard about Grace DeBacari, she convinced the hospital to release her for healing. The first time I went, I didn't notice anything, you know? And Grace would always pray over me, and I, I could notice that I was feeling less pain each time that I went. And I could, I could move my shoulders, I could move my hands, because I could hardly lift my hands. I couldn't raise my hands up. Today, Harriet Grimaldi has more energy than ever. In fact, she is a volunteer gardener at the very hospital where she once lay dying. She survived a situation where nobody should have survived. And um, to the surprise of the medical community, we are unable to explain, A, why she survived the almost lethal situation. And second, why her disease didn't progress. And it almost appeared that it took a screeching halt and reversal. And I said, you should tell all your patients to come to Grace, those you can't help. I tell the doctors. Doctors who practice near Grace's Connecticut home, like Dr. John Pagano, have started sending some of their patients to Grace's services. A friend of mine was deaf in the right ear for over 20 years. I knew he was. She pointed to him and said to him, you're going to be healed tonight. And in a few minutes, right after that, he was absolutely startled. A pop took place in his right ear, and he actually staggered back a bit. And even Grace, at that moment, said, did, did you hear that? And all the people around him heard something take place in his ear. From that moment on, and that was about 10 years ago, he's had perfect hearing in the right ear. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what denomination you are, God loves all people of all faiths, all religions. He just loves. What I think is happening is that grace in one way or another stimulates the healing forces within the people themselves. The God within them is acting because they either have faith in her or there are some cases where they had no faith in her and it still worked. That even defies explanation. There was one man, he went reluctantly. He had a herniated disc. I went there and my wife didn't even want to come with me. She says, I'll drive you there, but I'm not going in. He was like ducking behind the people, but Grace picked him out and told him to come forward. He was gonna be healed. I fell over like these other people, which I never dreamed I'd do. While I was down, I felt heat come through my back, through my legs, my thighs, and I started to squirm on the floor. I just like straightened out, and I was able to, to try to get up. The ushers were trying to help me. She says, no, he'll get up on his own. And I was able to get up on my own, and I stood up straight for the first time in six months. My, I was actually straight. I started to cry in front of these people who I didn't want to be here with. And God touched me just like that. If the concept of Jesus Christ is what stimulates the healing powers within you, then that's right. If the concept of science stimulates the healing power within you, that's, that's OK, too. Or God, the universal consciousness and all that, whatever it is, whatever avenue your consciousness is attuned to, that's what will work for you. It's important to know that Grace DeBacari doesn't take any money for the faith healing she performs, and she doesn't believe any true healer should. She also wants you to know that she does not consider faith healing a substitute for conventional medical care. Next, there's something unholy in the catacombs beneath the Church of San Francisco. It was a very powerful force. I was alarmed and scared. It wouldn't let me enter.
In an effort to provide a global view of the paranormal experience, Sightings is broadening the scope of its investigations. Recently, I traveled to South America and in Lima, Peru, discovered a haunting secret buried beneath a centuries-old cathedral. It was in 1535, the first year of the Spanish colonization, that the Cathedral of San Francisco was begun here in the oldest part of Lima, Peru. For centuries, the friars here have talked of encountering what they call unsettled spirits. Not surprising, perhaps, for a place that is built literally on the bones of tens of thousands of people. The catacombs were first built as the foundation for the church. They were in fact the cemetery of the church and of its parishioners. The catacombs are immense, and there are many human remains, bones and skulls, which are interred here. Macabre designs have been created in the catacombs below this historic cathedral, created with the bones of more than 25,000 seemingly restless spirits. There are people who don't believe it, but once you see it, you believe. You have to have a certain sight in order to see spirits. A priest once told me that ghosts have so much power that they move faster than thought. Father Benito is 82 years old. He has lived and worked in the church since he was a child. Over the years, he has seen many ghostly apparitions rising from the catacombs below. He was tall, and he was wearing a monk's habit. I was stunned. I just stood there, and he walked to another wall where the door was closed, and he walked right through the closed door. Naturally, it shocks you because your heart beats faster and your, your legs get a little weak, you know? After he goes away, you pray to God because of the power of the spirit. Today, the Cathedral of San Francisco is a refuge where the citizens of Lima seek solace and find peace. But it has not always been this way. The history of the area, in fact, all of Peru, is drenched in the blood of the Spanish Inquisition, spearheaded by Francisco Pizarro. Just outside Lima stand the ruins of the ancient religious center of Pachacamac. The conquistadors desecrated the temple and declared its followers heretics and devil worshippers. Most of the people here were murdered, and the rest were enslaved and forced to build a new city of Lima and its new church. The Inquisition lasted for more than 300 years. The accused and the accusers are now entombed together. I wanted to go into the catacombs with a flashlight, but I was unable to. There was a very powerful force. I was alarmed and scared. It wouldn't let me enter. Cristal is one of Peru's most famous psychics. Although she knew about the spirits in the Cathedral of San Francisco, she had never dared to personally enter the catacombs. At Sighting's request, she agreed to descend into the haunted tombs. Almost immediately, she became agitated, then seemed to make contact with an unseen force. I feel the presence of someone here. Very energetic, very negative. Muy violenta. Very violent. Que fue enterrado por casualidad acá. He was buried here. Mató a mucha gente. He killed many people. La descripción de este espíritu era... The spirit would definitely be described as being native to Peru. He had been a great witch or a shaman in his time. He had absorbed the energy of a friar who was there. The two of them interchanged their energies. He was accused of... Matar. Murder. for using witchcraft against others. He's full of hate. And he doesn't want us to be here. Cristol tried to communicate with the dark spirit, and it seemed to respond. He's standing right in front of me. There was an abrupt physical change in Cristal. 
She said the force had entered her body. Stop. Stop. Later, she would describe it as a battle of the souls, a battle she won by releasing the spirit. Walk toward the light. Do it. Liberate yourself. I understand everything. She said it was her psychic connection to his pain that allowed the spirit to go free. After I'd listened to him, I made him see that he was wrong, that he had died and that what he was doing wasn't right. And he accepted it. These are the physical remains of soldiers and slaves, priests and sorcerers. And while dead men tell no tales, their spirits often do, especially here, where people who battled each other in life seem to cry out for peace in death. While it seems that Crystal was able to release one of the restless spirits from the catacombs, it's estimated that more than 20,000 people are buried there. The friars of the Cathedral of San Francisco report that the haunting activity is as pervasive as ever. Next was what crashed at Roswell, a flying saucer made in the USA. They've channeled this information from what they thought were extraterrestrials. Recently, sightings brought you an extended report on government experiments with saucer-shaped aircraft. We showed you the Avro car, a crude experimental craft first tested in the 1950s. Well, now, newly declassified documents reveal that the military was testing and flying much more sophisticated saucer designs. The secret project was codenamed Silverbug. Near the end of World War II, the Allied forces had gained complete air superiority over Hitler's Luftwaffe. The Germans were desperate. They ordered the immediate development of an aircraft capable of vertical takeoffs and landings because nearly all of their runways had been destroyed. The project was spearheaded by Dr. Richard Mita, known today as the father of saucerology. Dr. Mita was hired by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, to build a saucer-shaped craft that could vertically ascend and, with rockets, shoot down large numbers of Allied planes. But the Germans were too late. The war ended before Mita's saucer got off the drawing boards. But his designs and technological breakthroughs did not go unnoticed by the American military. We had large numbers of technical people searching through Germany as, as they were moving right behind the troops. They began in April of 1945. And they would send back uh, everything they found. And according to Alexander Flax, former assistant secretary of the Air Force, German technology wasn't the only thing being shipped to North America. After World War II, Dr. Mita himself began work on a secret aircraft project at A.V. Rowe Aeronautics in Canada. Dr. Mita at A.V. Rowe was working on some of the concepts that were derived from the German experience. And there were certainly saucer-like flying machines. Anybody looking at them could have decided that these were indeed flying saucers. And there is evidence that soon after the war, the United States had also launched a super secret project to develop vertical flight vehicles. The vertical takeoff and landing programs had a long, long history. We had many, many programs among the three services. I counted at least 35. Of those 35 saucer projects, the most highly classified was known by the code name Silverbug. Silverbug saucers were designed to fly 2,300 miles per hour at an altitude of 80,000 feet. These designs, dating from 1955, were not declassified until March of 1995. For over 40 years, America's number one flying saucer project was top secret. But this flying saucer project was not. In the 1950s, while Project Silverbug was under tight wraps, A.V. Rowe unveiled the Avro car to the public. Was this jerry-rigged flop really the best the brilliant Dr. Mita could create? The Avocar is just a cover. It's a cover story. What was actually built by A.V. Rowe is anybody's guess. 
Ufologists believe that the U.S. military had everything to gain and nothing to lose by insinuating that this was the state of the art for flying saucers. It would deflect attention away from real saucers being tested and spotted by amateur sky watchers in the American Southwest. There is virtually no doubt in my mind that the United States government built German-inspired designs in this country. They were probably seen by many people and probably some crashed. The release of Silverbug's plans and protocol offers an interesting twist in the great debate over what crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. It could very well have been a flying saucer, but one of ours, not one of theirs, and not the first. In Germany, at about the turn of the century, many, many secret societies developed. The Vril machine was built by the Vril Society. And the Vril saucer was, in turn, based on the instructions left behind by a mysterious ancient cult. These texts were instructions on how to build this interdimensional machine. They've channeled this information from what they thought were extraterrestrials. Built this craft that levitated. The first piloted flight was in 1934, and uh, they knew they had something at that point. It appears that the saucer silhouette will soon be seen in the skies again. This is the Tier 3 minus UAV. It's a state-of-the-art surveillance drone built at the world-famous Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California. Looking at this aircraft head-on, one can't help but observe that saucers are real. If you've had a paranormal experience, please write to us at Sightings. Sightings can also be contacted at America Online at keyword sightings. At the Sightings Forum, download images, sounds, and quick-time clips. Also, join us daily in our chat room, live on AOL. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, Dark Shadows. Are we dealing with an epidemic? Bold experiment. We recombine termite and mantid DNA to create a biological counteragent. Becomes a deadly mistake. They were designed to die. They are breeding. But how do you destroy it when you've created it? Mira Sorvino. Mimic. Saturday at 7 p.m. on Sci Fi.